Hey YouTube, good morning. So I had a great uh, little uh, live stream last night with uh, Samuel Charlie and a few others on YouTube. It was kind of fun. And there were a lot of questions about my extended release axtelic acid. And I even got some comments this morning on some of my other videos in YouTube. So even though I don't need any strips at the moment because I already have some made up, I think it's worth the time to put together a video for those of you that are just getting started in your season and are interested in trying out the extended release, uh, how I do it. Um, the basis of this um, method comes from Randy Oliver's um, research on how many grams of oxalic acid can be uh, put um, successfully with good efficacy inside of a hive for mite control and then all of the different substrates that have been uh, used in order to um, put this um, oxalic acid inside the hive. Randy has settled on uh, Swedish sponges which um, are these cellulose materials and he lays them across the top bars. I currently do not prefer that method because as a backyard hobbyist beekeeper, I'm in my hives way more than Randy is and working the hives with something laying across the top bars is a little bit cumbersome for me. It's kind of like having a pollen patty on your top bars and you have to scrape it off every time you need to get in there. So I prefer to have strips that hang down between the frames. And this is very similar to the actual method that is used in Argentina uh, in the commercial product that's available called Aloe and Cap. You can't buy this in the United States yet, but the method I'm gonna show you is as close to that Aloe and Cap um, commercial product that's available uh, in other parts of the world as I've been able to come up with. So stick along with me. I'm gonna give you all that I've learned and tried and uh, tell you a few stories about how I got here. But, um, okay, to summarize, this is about oxalic acid, which you get off of uh, eBay's where I source it. You can get off of Amazon also. And glycerin being mixed together with a little bit of water to create a solution that we soak into a substrate, Remedia, uh, that we choose to put inside of our hives. Obviously, I'm just gonna stop at this point and say there is a lot of opinion on, on whether this is legal or not. You need to kind of look into your states. There's some new information from the EPA about you know if you're putting hives on less than 10 acres, unless your state has a more prohibitive rule, you can use uh, experimental methods with um, substances such as oxalic acid in your hive. But I'll leave that up to you to decide how you wanna manage your bees in your hive and based on your condition and whether or not uh, you're selling um, commercially and, and have to put that on your label. But the media I have chosen to use is chipboard. Uh, this goes between the hives. I will say previously, I was using shop towels years ago. Uh, and matter of fact, Randy and I even kind of collaborated a little bit. I, I won't say I collaborated. I gave him some data. He gave me some kind of instructions on some uh, methodologies he wanted data on. And I laid some um, shop towels across the uh, top bars with different uh, solutions to see how the bees chewed up the um, actual shop towel um, material. And I'll, I'll put a picture of that here just to kind of remind you guys on, on where that was and, and, you know, kind of where we came. But, and I use shop towels for a long, long time. But the problem with a shop towel is, you know, and I didn't lay them across the hive. I hung them down in between the frames. And shop towels just don't have any rigidity. And they, it's kind of like pushing a rope down between the frames. Whereas these chipboard strips, and here's a, a, a group of 42 I've already cut up that come from this chipboard, have a little bit of rigidity and you can push them down in between the hives. Uh, just to show you, this is the end product. This is my last batch and you can kind of see they are cardboard folded over strips that hang down between the hives. And this is very, very similar to the Aloe and Cap product. I will say the length of this is important. If you notice, this is the length of an 11 by 17 piece of chipboard. That is kind of my recommendation here. So let me go ahead and put this down and put this to the side. This is the end product. When working with oxalic acid, it is corrosive, um, but you can use a neutralizing agent. This is baking soda. I'm gonna show you uh, later on in the video how I use this, but I always kind of have it around me if I'm touching it without gloves so that my hands get neutralized from the acid. So now that I've uh, washed my hands there, I no longer have active acid on my hands. So, Cutting the strips is the first stage here, and getting to this point, you need your media to buy it. This is sourced from Amazon. This is chipboard. The thickness is what matters. 
You can buy smaller sheets, five by seven, anything. You can buy thinner sheets and it's cheaper. Don't go thinner than 50 point. And I'm saying that because I've done it. And if you soak material thinner than 50 point, it kind of just turns into goo and oozes and breaks apart and, and you can't really handle it. The 50 point holds up well. Now, this is used in many different things, scrapbooking, um, photo backings, uh, all sorts of stuff. It feels kind of like the pad, the back of a legal pad's kind of a piece of cardboard. Now, this is sheets of it in 11 by 17, which saves me a little bit of extra cutting. But if you've ever been to home, <clears throat> excuse me, I noticed I've been clearing my throat a lot in these last few videos. If you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you'll find contractor matting that is sold in these big rolls. And if you've ever had a contractor come in your house and tape down cardboard everywhere so that when they track in and out of your house, they don't damage your floors or perhaps scratch up anything on your, on your floor. If that is thick enough, that is basically the same type of material, but in my opinion, way too much material. You just don't need that much to buy a whole roll of that. So chipboard, 50 point. If you can get 60 point, that's probably okay too. That's a little bit thicker, but 50 point has worked well for me. And I just wanna say 50 points is a measurement measuring thickness like this. It equals about 0.05 inches. And I put uh, my calipers on here also just to measure it. And this measures at about 1.25 millimeters. That's a, the approximate thickness of it. And you can buy it in boxes like this. So I'm gonna just show you how I cut it up. The thickness of these matters a little bit. When I say thickness, the width. Um, probably no thinner than this. And I've cut these to one and a half inches wide, which is about 40 millimeters. And the reason I cut them that wide is because my square that helps me cut all these is one and a half inches wide. If I were to cut it this wide, that would probably work too. That's probably closer to two inches, but it might be a little bit too wide. Um, so one and a half inches is probably a good starting point. Then make your own determination about how to cut it. And the way I uh, cut these up is I just take a piece of the chipboard and you want the full length this way. And, and the reason you want the full length is because, of, and this is why I had the frame set out. I'm gonna get my hands dirty again. When you have a frame with brood on it and you set these in your hive, you set them across the top bar so they hang down. That length is about right. If you had shorter strips, you would either have to hang it down on one side and not the other to get the full length down, or if you hung it centered, it, it, it wouldn't be kind of deep enough into the hive. So this 11 by 17 is about the right dimension. It looks like, you know, see, if you wanted to go the full length and you could source, you know, material that's a little bit longer than 17, that might work. But that is why 11 by 17 is working for me. All right. Um, I'm gonna just show you a little bit how I cut these strips up. I've already got a batch here, and one batch with my recipe is about 42 strips, and I've got that marked from last time because that worked pretty well. So you just lay this out on some sort of cutting medium and make it square and cut the, the full length of the medium. And let me just get a knife and show you how you do it. So you could do this on a paper cutter also. Um, that's not really important, you know, how you cut it. It's just, you know, getting it kind of a consistent um, thickness so that when you use up your media, you have it in nice strips. So there's how I cut them. You see, it's the exact same length there. And just re cut and repeat. How you cut this does not matter. You can cut it thicker. You can cut it, you know, well, I mean thicker, when I say thicker, wider, but I don't think I would cut any shorter than 17 inches. So that's the tip there. Okay, I'm not gonna continue cutting this because you don't need to see me cut this up, but that's how I do it. This is kind of one of those mats where you can use a knife. Doesn't really matter. Okay, on to the next step. Okay, the next step after you've got all your strips cut, um, in this batch, I'm gonna use about 45. I think on my, my label, I had 42 written. I'm gonna increase it just a little bit more to round it off. You need to pre-bend them. And this saves you time in the end so that when you get your strips, like I showed you earlier, they're already bent over and they're already in shape. So when they soak up the oxalic acid, you're no longer gonna have to bend them, which might break them once they get a little bit more fragile. So this is the frame that they're gonna hang over. This is just an example frame. Get a little piece of wood or something that same width. You could use the frame 
frame if you want, but you kind of need to get to the midpoint of these and fold them over. So you can measure what the midpoint is. These are, you know, 17, so that's gonna be eight and a half inches the midpoint. You know, you could take something like this and just bend them up and over uh, like that. And you need to pre-fold them and I know it's not hard. You just gotta kind of be repetitive so they're all the same. Um, a little piece of wood kind of saves you time. You might be able to get fancy and be able to do two of them at a time. I haven't done that, but I'll just, for demonstration purposes, give it a go. And I'm using the measurements on this mat just to do it. Um, okay, so there I, I folded two at a time. Let's see if I can do three at 50, uh, 50 point chipboard. Getting a little bit thicker, but the objective, you get it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and bend these up and uh, I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. Okay, I'm finished up here. I got all the way up to between four and five uh, chipboard strips uh, to bending a piece with a nice piece of wood measured right in the middle. So now you can see I've got all of these chipboard strips folded and you can see they don't really kind of lay down nice, right? So this is the way I do it. You know, kind of take a, a batch that kind of does fold down nice like that. I don't know, maybe that's about 10 or 11, something like that. That's even too many. So let's take two out of there till they bend down and then interweave them like this. Just a technique. Uh, those of you that know I'm an, uh, an airline pilot, you know, and, and a former Navy pilot, we use, uh, uh, some differentiation with terms. One of them is technique and another one is procedure. Procedure is something you have to do in order to get it right. A technique is a modification of a procedure that just varies it a little bit, but you know, you can either do it or not and still come out with success. So this is a technique. Um, so when I've got all 40, I think I got 45 of them here, they're all kind of tight and ready to go. Now, the next step is important. <clears throat> Why did I do 45? Well, it's based on the recipe. And I am gonna put a 50-50 glycerin uh, water mixture in here, and I'm gonna use the amount of oxalic acid and glycerin that will absorb into this material. And I divide the total number of grams of oxalic acid I'm putting into the solution by the number of strips to approximate how many grams per strip I will have. Now, granted, there's gonna be a little bit of residual solution in the bag that you soak them in, and it's not all gonna get absorbed, and some of it will kind of flake off in the end. I don't know if you noticed on these strips here how some of it can kind of flake off and fall off. Um, but the point is you need to be able to approximate how many grams of oxalic acid you choose to put inside of your hive. Um, I currently put about two, strip, two strips per brood chamber. Obviously, this is another technique based on the amount of uh, mite load you have, whether you're maintaining or what. But the point is, is you put these in and you leave it. This is not like a strip that you have to time the day you put it in or the, you pull it out. Extended release oxalic acid is meant to go into the hive and stay there until the bees get rid of it. And they will chew up these strips depending on the genetics of the hive. What I've seen so far, and I'll show you some, some videos, uh, they, they chew them up at the edges and right here, and sometimes this whole thing will fall down because they chewed up the top corner. Some of them kind of gnaw at the bottom edges, which is exactly the behavior you want so that the bees are in the, interacting with the strips and getting the oxalic acid on them and spreading it throughout the hive. Okay, so we got our strips. Now it's time to make our solution and prepare to soak these uh, for the final product. Stick with me. Okay, YouTube, now to the fun part, making the solution. Okay, so I think I've got everything set up in here and uh, I'm just gonna kinda go through a few safety items and then uh, uh, we're gonna get going into the recipe. I've got everything here I need uh, to do this project so it's right near. Um, for those of you that are concerned about cooking inside of my barn shed, this is an induction hot plate. I highly recommend them in safe environments. If this were to fall off or whatever, the heat stops and you can put your hand right on this. Induction is an amazing uh, safety device. Uh, just a, a, a pan, obviously. Um, I always leave my water baking soda mixture right next to me. This is not a precise thing. There's even some baking soda still in the top here. What, I filled it up a couple cups here and I threw in like a, a quarter cup of baking soda and mixed it up. If I get any oxalic on my hands or anything like that, I've already soaked this towel, I can just wipe it all off. Um, oxalic acid is corrosive to metals and things like that. So if you, if you 
spread any around, just wipe it off. It just neutralizes it instantly. And the last part is this. If you're cooking with oxalic acid or any sort of acids, and especially if you're unfamiliar with what might happen, put on some goggles. It is not worth your eyes. Like I mentioned a little while ago, I'm also a commercial pilot um, part-time, so my eyes are important to me. And if you're over 40, they make these with cheaters in them. So there's no excuse for being able to see. Okay, so back to our recipe. Remember I told you that we want about... 50 to 50 oxalic acid glycerin with some water for dilution. I'm going to give you the formula here in a second. I got 45 strips and I want about 10 grams of oxalic acid per strip. So I need 450 grams of oxalic acid. So what you need to do is get you some sort of kitchen scale that measures in grams. And this is the oxalic acid I use. It says oxalic acid 99.6 purity. This is a five pound bag. Um, I go to grams. And I put the beaker on before I set the tear value to zero so the weight of the beaker is not being included. And then I just need to get 450 grams. All right, I went a little over. There's 462. I'm going to be precise for the purposes of this experiment. And there is 450 grams. Okay, so just for, for you know... 450 grams of oxalic acid looks like, you know, without compressing it down, it's about 550 milliliters worth. That doesn't matter. Do it by weight. Uh, and then go ahead and put that in your pot. Now, you don't need to clean this out completely because if you set the tear value um, down to zero when you're weighing, uh, th that's all that matters. Now, for the glycerin, to that point, I am going to put a volume in here now. I need 450 milliliters not grams, volume of the glycerin. That is the ratio. Uh, and I'm going to just go ahead and measure 450, and it's right about there. I'm eyeballing it. Here's my glycerin. All right. And the next, after I'm going to go ahead and pour this in the bowl, and we're going to mix it up a little bit. Now, while this is draining, it doesn't all have to come out of there, and I'm going to talk about that in a point. The basic recipe that I'm using is off of Randy Oliver's work. Full credit goes to Randy Oliver for doing all of the experimentation. I did send him a little bit of data. Whether he used it in his analysis or not, I do not know, but he gets all of the credit. Randy, if you're watching, thank you for all of your efforts to our community. You make a big, big difference. Um, but the recipe I've settled on is both easy to remember and easy to mix, and it actually is right in his range. And it basically is two parts oxalic acid, two parts glycerin, one part water. Knowing that you're mixing units though, okay? So 450 grams is two parts, 450 milliliters is the other two parts. Mixing grams and milliliters is not normally done, but just for the, for the purpose of this. And I am going to use 225 milliliters of water. That's the one part. So if you were to scale it up, you could say one part water, 225, two parts glycerin, um, I'm sorry, 450, yep. And then uh, two parts oxalic acid, 450 grams by weight of oxalic acid. So that is the recipe. I'll put that down in the description below. If it changes over time, I usually will keep the, the description current, but that is the ratio that I have settled on and, and works well. Now, the reason the ratio is important is because that sets the amount of stickiness, the amount of glycerin in solution, so that the final product, based on the medium you are using, and we're using chipboard to where it doesn't completely, uh, based on the high temperatures of around 95 degrees, come out of solution. So it needs to kind of stay into the chipboard at high temperatures. If you kind of mess with it a little bit more, they get a little bit too wet and the bees don't chew it, and the other extreme, they get too crusty and then the oxalic acid just comes right out of solution. So that's the reason for the ratio. You can go look on Randy Oliver's website for all of the details on that. And that is also my experience that it matters. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on to heat this up a little bit. And uh, I'm going to go get a stirring stick. Now, while this is starting to heat up, there's one temperature related item that you need to kind of keep uh, aware of. And that is that you do not want this solution to get over 160 degrees. There's a chemical reaction that can happen that is not advantageous to the solution we're trying to achieve if it gets too hot. So think of this as warming it up to get it to go into solution. Mixing this oxalic acid is a little bit like mixing two to one sugar water. Sometimes at certain temperatures, you just can't get that sugar to dissolve. 
this is sort of the same thing in this glycerin water mixture. You just sort of need it to kind of get warm to go into solution. Now, while that's starting to um, warm up, I'm going to show you my water. So remember I said I'm using 225 milliliters, which is one part water. I used distilled water initially when we started doing this years ago. We thought we had to use distilled water because we didn't want the hardness of your local water to affect the... Um, the mixture of the ratios back again to randy randy has done some more work that the the amount of oxalic acid coming out of solution based on the hardness of your water hardness in water is dissolved minerals is insignificant so probably no need to run out and buy distilled water anymore i'm probably not going to buy it again i'll just use this jug but uh, distilled water is handy to have around for other you know backyard chemist experiments like i like to have but it is not required uh, we believe at this point so now here's a technique Remember I told you that um, techniques do not have to always be followed, but I typically, as this is warming up, use about half of the water. Now, there's a reason for that, and I didn't necessarily do it in the order that that matters. If you had poured the glycerin in first, so let's say I had poured in um, 450 milliliters of glycerin, and then I put my... Um, beaker back on the scale and set my tear value back to zero and then I weighed 450 grams of oxalic acid and then I poured all that in there because of the glycerin and the um, oxalic acid on the edge of that beaker it had been like oxalic acid stuck to the sides um, one of the reasons I use the technique of only using half the water is because I can now use this water as part of the solution to clean out the beaker. So if this had oxalic acid in it, I could kind of roll it on the sides. I can get all of my glycerin and my uh, oxalic acid out of here. And then I, nice and clean and my measurements are more accurate. So that's just a technique. You don't have to follow it. But, you know, if you do it in that order where the water comes last, you can use your one part of water to um, clean out your beakers so that you didn't waste any of your uh, oxalic acid or that your measurements are more accurate. So all we are doing at this point, now that we have all three ingredients into the pot, is trying to get it into solution, which means get the oxalic acid to dissolve. Don't let it get too hot. You know, I'm not gonna measure it because I've been doing this by, by sight long enough. I know that if it goes into solution quick, I'm done and I'm gonna continue to stir it. Um, this is where, if you didn't have your safety equipment on, no glasses, and you splattered or something like that, if, if this gets on your clothes and you don't get it with um, the baking soda, you're going to get a little bit of corrosion on your, on your clo clothing too. Wearing gloves would per be perfectly appropriate uh, right now too. I would even say I probably should have them on, but the fact I've got baking soda in my hand is the reason I'm not at the moment. Okay. So keep a close eye on this. Don't walk away too far. I'm going to kind of let the, the time run here, and I may do a, a, a time lapse if it gets a little bit too long to get in the solution, but I'm going to get the next step ready so I can show you that. This is an extra large Ziploc bag. You do not need a Ziploc this large to do it, but the point is, is you need to put your strips into something where when we pour that solution over them, that they can soak. Now, if you have a plastic bucket, I would not recommend metal. If you have a plastic bucket that can fit, you know, these things, and, and you see how they're kind of getting all around. I kind of want to keep them straight so they stay nice and straight. Um, so, Because what we're going to do is pour that liquid in there. We're going to try to take as much of the air out so that it goes into solution. I've got a five gallon bucket here, and these are basically going to go in here in case there's a leak in my bag. But that is now ready for uh the solution i'm starting to see it's got still got some clumps in here sometimes with my little stir stick i use um to just kind of break these little clumps up this is a little bit like my uh swarm lure mixture i made yesterday if you hadn't watched that video i'm experimenting with glycerin uh, which is this stuff right here and gelatin, which is probably in your cabinet if you've got any unflavored gelatin. If not, it's really, really cheap. When you mix the uh, glycerin and gelatin together, it makes a very unique rubber substance that I'm using for my swarm uh, lures these days. Check that out. Okay, we're getting closer. It's definitely going into solution. Just a few more minutes here, and I'm going to just make sure everything is ready. Continuing to use my hands there all 
All right, while that's finishing heating, I'm gonna move the camera down and try to get the camera back in the spot here. But you can see, I've got my strips in there inside the bag and I'm gonna pour that solution in there and then I'm, the solution will be around the bag. Without the bag, you know, if you ever brined a turkey, um, the bag is a big part of how the brine gets on the bird. You can take all the air out and it's kind of the same sort of thing where you're just trying to minimize the amount of space and maximize the absorption of the solution. Okay, we're getting really, really close here. Don't want it to get too hot. And I'm just gonna, yeah, it's definitely not at 160 back in the baking soda solution. 160 is hot to the touch. You would notice it if it was at 160. I'm almost in solution completely here and then we are going to be mixing it and that is going to be a, the hardest part of this whole process is this part right here getting the formulas right heating it without overheating it and then having your bag and your and or bucket ready to soak up your mixture all right we are looking good let me see how the, I'm going to just kind of show you a little bit here while I've got that. Since I've got oxalic acid and baking soda, if I've got oxalic acid on here, you see that reaction? Instantly neutralized it. But that foaming action inside that baking soda was visual evidence of the fact that I'm neutralizing that acid. Okay. Did you hear my little induction? Look at that. I'm touching it. Not hot. Um, this is what it looks like. See how there's no more clumps? It's completely in solution. Be very careful wherever you are. Don't splatter. If you're in your kitchen, wherever you are, splatter is kind of the dangerous part here, but that's what the baking soda is for. It's completely in solution. Now, if I was hot enough, and look at that. See the stainless steel? Even a little bit of acrylic acid corrosion going on there. Um, I'm going to neutralize that here in just a second too. But if this bag melted, it's in the bucket. Uh, if your bag had a hole in it, it's in the bucket. These are all just safety precautions. Now, I'm just gonna kinda show you. Here they all are. And now they're at the bottom of the bucket, in solution. And I'm just gonna kinda let them soak here now to let all of that solution get on those strips and soak in. This takes about 24 hours. Honestly, it doesn't take that long, but that's how long uh, most of us leave this alone to sit um, and soak up. It'll be in solution very, very quickly in those strips. So they soak up very, very fast. Obviously, if you had a corner where one of them wasn't exposed, the initial few seconds here to slosh around to get it everywhere is helpful. Um, in other containers, if they don't fit in perfectly, you might need to kind of back and forth and back and forth so that the absorption is somewhat even. While this is warm, it's all even in solution. As it cools down, it can kind of get a little bit gummy and it, it, you know, it might not absorb evenly. So at its warmest is the best time to get even distribution. All right, I'll just kind of show you how it looks now and how much liquid is left. You can see a little bit of liquid in there still. It's soaking in, but it's, everything is coated and everything is in water or in the uh, solution now and i can see that there's a little bit of liquid in the bottom of this bucket so this bag might have a little pinhole leak in it which is what the bucket is for i've obviously been touching that bag so i'm going to use my baking soda now also i'm going to kind of show you here this corrosion that's the nature of it now this is something that you know obviously you don't pour a lot of acids and bases together quickly so i'm going to put a little bit at a time in here and if you can see this, baking soda, never mix acids and bases quickly together. Um, and this didn't have any acid in it. It was just residue on the pan, but obviously just sticking on the sides of the pan. But what I want you to see is the magic of chemistry and how I'm essentially cleaning my pan with the baking soda and now all of that acid is neutralized even this little solution is no longer dangerous it's been completely neutralized that is the mixture that is the soak these are going to be uh, ready for um the next tomorrow they would be ready so if you were going to put these in a hive you could put them in a hive tomorrow um let me show you just a couple videos and clips here of how they look inside of my hive 
I'm going to show you one real time now in my observation hive, and then I'm probably going to take some screen captures from videos over the last few days where you can see they are in my regular hives. But here's the example. This is how they hang and see how this looks just, just like that example I showed you earlier out of the bag. But if you notice here, see how the bees are chewing at this? And if you look up here, which you probably can't see at that angle, the top of this corner up here has been chewed away. But they've propolized it so this isn't gonna fall, but this is how they chew. And if you look in my beetle traps in here, this is actually chipboard particles that they chew down and fall into my beetle trap. So that little hive gunk is just them chewing this out. So over time, when I look at my, the bottom of my hives, I see a lot of cardboard coming out in this kind of particulate dust form factor uh, from them chewing it and hauling it out. Okay, so that's what it looks like inside the hive. I'll show you a few screen caps um, from uh, some observations I've made over the last few days, but put them in there, forget about them, Check your mites. I already did a mite check video if you're interested in looking at that. All right, YouTube, I couldn't stand it. I had to show you live. I, I know I was gonna show you some screenshots and I probably already have, but I'm gonna just poke you into my long hive here and let you see. So do you see how that strip is hanging over there? This is it right here and how they've kind of chewed it up a little bit. Um, I'm not wearing any equipment, so hopefully these ladies are in a good mood this morning. But I just wanna show you real quick how it works in the hive there are some features of these to where the bees kind of don't build a lot of wax around them but honestly i think that's just them observing bee space and you know because i'm using up bee space with some other material they just don't have room to walk around it so they end up building up some wax but look how this chip has been chewed up this is exactly what you want to see they're chewing it up they're walking under it. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a perspective here of what it's like under here. Look at that. They're even raising brood under there. See how they've propolized it up top a little bit too? So extended release, oxalic acid, chipboard strips. I think uh, the Argentinians are right. The aloe and cat product, I hope we can sell here in the United States. Uh, until that point, it's up to you. Take care of your bees, take care of your mites. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. This is extended release oxalic acid vapor, um, not vaporization, extended release oxalic acid strips in your hive. Have a great day.